try it now. Okay, so we uh, came to understand that we had a little technical difficulty maybe with the sound. We got a uh, top-notch technician there working behind the scenes. And so we're going to just start that chapter over and hopefully you'll be able to hear it a little better. Good. Good. And Very the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, <clears throat> whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast. God said, It is mine. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which ye came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out from this place. There should be no leavened bread to be eaten. This day came ye out in the month Abib, and we had mentioned uh, that Abib is also sometimes referred to as Nisan, or Nisan. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of Canaanites, and the Hittites, and Amorites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy father to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep this service in this month. <clears throat> so God is calling them to remember. This, uh, this is a memorial, right? <clears throat> Verse 6, Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters, or where they were dwelling their homes. What does the leavened bread signify? So nice. No rise. <laughs> okay, no rise, but what, what is it saying? What, what was the leaven? What it, was leaven? It, it was, it the was false religion. Okay, the, the, the leaven was sin, okay? So uh, the, this uh, is a, <coughs> you know, the, the, the sin was uh, considered to be leaven or, or symbolized as leaven. And, you know, it would rise in your heart and it would play out its, its role, etc. So the unleavened bread was a time when you were were repenting of all your sin, you were consecrated more fully to the Lord, etc., focusing more on the truth, etc., etc. And so God is reminding them every, every year during this memorial, you need to get sin out of your life, you know? And only you can really do that, right? Only you can make choice to really do that. And it, it becomes a choice. It becomes a choice. Okay? God has provided all the power that we need, right? to remove, and he's, he's the uh, forgiving Heavenly Father, <clears throat> and so forth, and he's made made possible power for us to make the right choices. Boy, have I been getting that wrong. <laughs> yeah, okay, so unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leavened bread seen with you or in any of your quarters. Verse 8 says, And thou shalt show thy son, and thou shalt show thy son in that day, saying, this is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. So this information, this ceremony was repeated year after year. And as children would grow up, the parents would have an opportunity to explain the significance of it and reason for it to the children. And then as the children grew up, they would do the same. And it would just keep going down generation to generation to generation. A memorial. Okay. And it shall be for a sign to thee upon thine hand and a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth, for the strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in, in, its, in his season from year to year, and it shall be when the Lord shall bring unto thee the, into the land of Canaan, into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and it shall, <clears throat> it shall give, it, give it thee. Thou shalt, all these, these, and those. Thou shalt, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth matrix, and be firstling that cometh of a breast which thou hast. All males shall be the Lord's. And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. And all the firstborn of men among thy children shall thou redeem. And it shall be, and it shall be when thy son asketh thee, in time to come, saying, What is this? That thou shalt say to him, By strength the hand of the Lord brought us out of out from Egypt from the house of bondage. And it came pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrificed to the Lord all that opened at the matrix, being males, 
but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. So the Lord has a whole, there's always a reason for everything that the Lord does, right? And anything that he asks us to remember, to, to any instruction he gives, it's all for a reason. And it's not necessarily just the most obvious reason. Sometimes it's very far-reaching and very significant. And it shall be for token unto thine hand, and for frontlets between thine eyes. For by strength of what, hand, what, what the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. What does that mean? That's between the eyes. Yeah, what do you think? Let's ask the question. It shall be for a token upon thine hand, and for a frontless between thine eyes. What does that mean? Frontless. Uh, these these were um, not mistaken. These were this was a um, um, a way to focus your attention on a specific thing. And of course, what he's wanting them to focus on is what truth. Truth and specifically the law, the law of God and the instruction that He's given. Okay. To and them, the law was the truth. That was it, period. Yeah. And it came to pass, and Pharaoh let the people go. <clears throat> then God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, Let's peradventure the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had straightly sworn the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud, and led them the way by night in the pillar of fire, to give them light, and to go by day and night. So, you know, as they're leaving, you know, a lot of people have the impression that, you know, this exodus took, you know, weeks to, uh, to get to the Red Sea, and all this kind of thing. And actually, prophetically, the, uh, the story of the, if you remember the story that Joseph had of the baker and the butler, remember three days the, uh, the, Baker was slain and the butler was restored, right? And uh, this was a prophecy of the Exodus that was to come. And of course, Joseph had, had asked him, you know, make sure I go with you, you take my bones, etc. This was a prophetic prophecy that it, it would take him three days. They'd be three days getting to the Red Sea and they would cross on the third day. And of course, Israel would be restored as a nation. Begin that risk restoration process would begin, and of course the the uh, where they had come from out of Egypt, the one that had provided all the food and resource and provision for all that time they were there, that that nation would be destroyed. So, Did you hear the news there where the Palestinians <laughs> set fire to Joseph's tomb right, over right. there in Israel? Yeah, I, I I I did hear that this past weekend. That's right. Yeah, they have no regard for things that uh, would be sacred in other people's eyes. So anyway, he took, he took not away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So, I mean, wouldn't that be nice? You know, sometimes we think about, Lord, if we just knew exactly what to do, you know, we would follow you. <laughs> you know, we need a pillar of fire. We need a pillar of cloud at night, you know, during the day. We need a pillar of fire at night. But don't we already have that? What do we call it? Call it God's wow. word. Call it God's word. A pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. Anyway, we'll pick it up in uh, chapter 14 uh, next week. All right. Um, we want to continue our series, our studies in, in uh, eschatology and prophecy. And uh, we're going to be looking at the, uh, the seventh trumpet. And I just stuck this on the board very quickly to remind you and help you on, and, and to uh, share with those who may be tuning in. We've already kind of exhausted a lot of insight here, but there's a sequence of events that occurs. Uh, we're told that the events connected with the close of probation and the time of trouble are clearly presented. Well, where are they clearly presented? In God's Word, right? But specifically, the book of Revelation, and probably indirectly the book of Daniel as well. Okay. Do you think maybe we ought to highlight for the new people the 
exactly what was going on there, like the first four trumpets are natural disasters? Yeah, we can actually put a little bit of time, because I think Daniel in mm -hmm. Revelation put a little bit of timing to this. Um, it is uh, one of the things you might want to say here, here too, is that um, this sequence of events here is uh, very contemporary in thought. In other words, we don't place the trumpets. I don't think God's Word places the trumpets hundreds of years back in history. Okay? A lot of organizations put the, put the trumpets way back in history. I think the trumpets, uh, just like if uh, somebody came outside uh, at night and started blowing a trumpet, it would wake you up, right? And you would go outside to see what was going on. Trumpets are used to sound a warning. And what's the most significant event to occur? The most significant event that's going to occur in human history is, is the close of human probation. Now Daniel said this was these trumps for the end of time. Daniel's, Daniel was saying that these things were, were going to occur at the end of time. Uh, he mentions that, uh, the time of the end, he mentions that many times. Some people, though, they'll say, well, you know, the time of the end began hundreds of years ago. Yeah. And... <clears throat> And what I would say is that, you know, when you look in the book of Revelation particularly, um, when... Wait a minute, wait a minute. If, no. it, if it meant for back for you know, hundreds of years ago or whatever, it, it was insignificant for us then. We, we, we couldn't see it. I mean, what right. good is it for us? Right. So you have application, and then you have fulfillment, ultimate fulfillment. <clears throat> That's the book of Revelation. And the book of Revelation is the ultimate fulfillment even though you can make many applications through history. What I'm going to say is that when the book of Revelation was written by John, he was writing at the end of the first century, right? Probably 90 A.D., somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, and, of course, the second century is going to begin just shortly. So he's sending that message out to seven literal churches. Okay? And prayerism, or, or the prayerist view of the book of Revelation, is that the book of Revelation was only applicable to those seven churches around Asia Minor. That was probably all they had at that time. Well, actually, there were more churches than that, but these seven were highlighted. Okay? There were more churches in that area, but there were seven that were particularly picked out and chosen for, for a specific reason. But, um, but a lot of people that look at Revelation from that standpoint, that it was just for those people in back there in history, okay, what happens, what happens, I mean, then you don't even bother to read it, right? Well, why even read it if it was for some other people some other time? Yeah, right. You know, you don't even need to read it. And, of course, many people that have that opinion that Revelation was for, for back there. Now, one thing that maybe folks have not noticed is that this preterist view occurs in every generation, okay? Because, or, or actually it developed in every generation. Because when you got past the, the first century and the apostles and so forth, and you went into the fourth and fifth century, you had people like Victorinus. Remember me telling about Victorinus? He was a fellow that wrote the first commentary on the book of Revelation. But he wrote it. He lived in the fourth or fifth century. He wrote it from the standpoint of his day. You see, it, so he became, it became a preterist view in his day. These things were for them. And then you come forward to another generation. All oh, these things are for us. So every generation uh, has kind of a preterist view, uh, in, in a sense. So if uh, we believe, if we believe that the uh, prophecies of Revelation and the information there is for our generation, because it deals with the ultimate fulfillments, then that's kind of a preterist view, isn't it? Okay? We believe it's for us in our day. Okay? So, so when we look back in history say these applications occurred back in history, they're valid. Or the, the applications are valid. I'm not saying they're not. But, for example, uh, you know, we look at the, uh, the time periods here. And when you look at the time periods, what number keeps coming up over and over again through Daniel and Revelation? What's one of the numbers that keeps coming up? 60. No, the three and a half. 1260. Yeah, okay. 1260 days comes up. Or three and a half years. Or three and a half years comes over and over again. Okay. Now we can we can go back and we can use the year day principle and we can say, well, you know, that twelve hundred and sixty days was, was twelve hundred and sixty years, and we can make an application, right, of uh, of certain events that took place uh, in history that correlate to what scripture is revealing. But when we get to the end, 
when we get to the, the ultimate fulfillments, do we have 1260 years? Does the time of the end involve 1260 years? No, no, it's gonna, it's gonna go literal to days. And so when we see these events, for example, last week we talked about the first four trumpets uh, spanning a time of three and a half years or 1260 days. And then we looked at the, let's see, the first four, one through four. And what's the distinction between them? What's the difference between disasters? Yeah, the difference between the first four and then five through seven. They are the first two four. four. You're right. Okay, so you got natural disasters, the first four. Okay, and we're just reading the, the words in the book for what they say. Um, different natural disasters. And the, there's a distinction because the last three are called what? What else? Woes. Okay, the last three trumpets are called woes. So, now, what was some else, Jerry? You have to remember? This thing can burn from 260 years to 260 days. Once the trumpets start, now it's 260 days. Correct. Yeah. Because we don't have extended periods of time no, at no. the end. Okay. And we're and we're for for those of you that have been looking at these things for weeks, and those that are here, we know that we're working from a larger blueprint, don't we? We're looking at a 7,000 year blueprint of time, as compared to some people that believe that it's just going to go on forever and ever. All right, so we got the trumpets, close probation in the place. This morning, what we want to do is we want to pick it up at the seventh trumpet. Okay, we've gone through uh, over the last several weeks. Which we'll, is the third one. Which is the third one. So I want to invite you to open up your Bibles. <clears throat> and we're in, uh, we're in chapter 11. Verse 14 says, The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Okay. Now, I want you to, you know, a lot of times when we think about these, these events in Scripture and the fact that they're numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc., a lot of times we might be thinking that as soon as number 1 ends, number 2 is beginning, as soon as number 2 begins, number 3 is beginning. That's not necessarily so. They could overlap. Uh, there could be a, a, a kind of a lag time in between some of these events. That's what's kind of indicated here in verse 14. The second woe is past. That's, that's history now. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Okay, So it does not, doesn't necessarily mean that they just right away begin one after so the other. No there could be, yeah, there could be some lag time. All right. So <clears throat> the third woe is coming. The third woe has to be the most devastating of all. Okay, um, and let's go through and see why. The seventh angel sounded, and there was a loud, and there were loud voices in heaven. I'm reading from the New King James, and there were loud voices in heaven. Now, you know this, this word in in the Greek is the word megos. It's a What does that look like to you? It's the Greek word there. Megas. Megaphone. Yeah, megaphone. Huge, great, big, phenomenal. I mean, awesome. It's 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 one of these words that's used uh, several. I think it's a couple hundred times in Scripture, but here in the Book of Revelation, it's used quite often. And why would God be kind of shouting this from a megaphone, if you will? Because he wants to get your attention. He doesn't want anybody to miss these. Because we are down close to this yes. event. Okay, we're getting close to that event there. All right? And we'll see that in just a, a few minutes. I'm going to stop you right fast. At what point right here, getting it at the fifth trumpet that Satan appears personally in Christ? Yes. Okay. Okay, this had to in my mind. So it is the fifth. So now he's already he's already working, and he'll work for twelve or sixty days, three and a half years. I believe okay. for three and a half years okay. he he, Got be, it. he steps into the picture. In fact, we're going to see that in, in chapter twelve more fully. Okay. But at any rate, is a loud the seventh angel sounds, and there's a loud there's loud voices, plural. That's plural in heaven. 
So, <clears throat> so who do you think is who, who do you think is in heaven wanting to you know why is such excitement in activity in heaven when the seventh trump sounds? Trump, they know they, they know they know something's about the, they know something they're significant they're, yeah. is coming coming to a milestone a milestone in, in not only human history but heaven history too coming to a milestone here okay. What? Loud voices in heaven, and what are they saying? What's what's the cry? What's the plea coming from whoa, heaven here? Whoa, whoa. The kingdoms. Look what it says here. The kingdoms five. Wow, uh, the far fifth. Continue with fifteen. The kingdoms of this world have become of our Lord and of His Christ. The, the, the word the kingdoms there is a supplied word, but the kingdoms of this world have become of our Lord and of His Christ. So what does that mean? And, and He shall reign forever and ever. So what conclusion have they come to in heaven? Why is there such excitement in heaven? Why is it being voiced all through heaven very loudly pro proclaiming that, what What are they proclaiming? That he is king and that he is going to step in and take complete total control. And he's going to eliminate sin. And, and take his rightful place. His rightful place. I mean, who has paid the ultimate price? Christ. Okay. The Son of God has paid the ultimate price for the possibility of salvation for humanity. You know, to, to go out and search for this lost sheep and then find it and then to redeem it, right, so it could come back into the sheepfold. I mean, the Son of God has paid the ultimate price, not only humanly, but divinely, all right? And <clears throat> and so that they, they, we've come to the place, we've come to the place in time where now the Son of God is going to be able to take his rightful place to rule uh, as as he should be ruling, and forever and ever. Okay. So look at the response now that the elders. Remember that there's 24 elders that are around the throne of God. There's four beasts. So here you have you have the six to one ratio symbolized around the throne in heaven. And remember we talked about the six to one ratio being the uh, <clears throat> it's the six thousand years of probation, the thousand year millennial period. The whole plan of salvation is based on this ratio. Here you have it represented around God's throne there as well. So the 24 elders, they step in. Right? They're before God and they fall on their faces and they worship God. And, and what do they say? We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have, because you have taken your great power and reign. Now that word taken there is the word lambano. It doesn't mean, you know, he kind of rushed out and said, you know, this is mine, I want it. You know, like like kids do sometimes. You know, as kids grow up, everything is mine, 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 so they go around taking stuff. That's not that's not the 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 word is a very broad application here. But it means that it's he's he's receiving something that's being offered to him. Okay? He's receiving something that's being offered. But this event what happens, what happens at this event here? What happens at the close of probation? Some major changes take place at the close of human probation. Just like around the ark. Back to the story of Noah and the ark. When the door closed, that set in motion uh, something catastrophic that would take place on this, on this planet. And the same thing will happen when probation is declared closed. And find that later on in chapter 22 of the book of Revelation. He that is unjust... Let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Set him. He that is holy, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. So every every character is fixed. You just lock everything in place. Everything is locked in place. Every decision has been made. Okay, and so heaven is rejoicing because now the Son of God is going to take His rightful place, and He's going to reign forever. There's there's always been this question mark in, in God's creation, in this, in God's kingdom. This question mark. See. As to, uh, you know, initially who's right, who was wrong, you know, does Satan have a case? Well, of course, the cross kind of clarified that, didn't it? But then we had, we had 2,000 more years of time go by where God is letting this, this 6 to 1 ratio play out, this probationary time play out, and for good reason. And for good reason. Okay, so what else happens here? Um, the nations were angry, and your wrath has come. Now, of course, often in Scripture, it's like almost like the Spanish language. They put the event or they put the action before or after the event. 
What happens at the close of probation concerning God's wrath? I mean, the trumpets before are affecting how much, how, how are the trumpets pictured in terms of the wrath of God being poured out? They're, they're, they're termed as a third, one third. One third of the trees were destroyed. One third of this happened. One third of that happened, okay? Um, one third of the earth was, was covered, you know, with a dark day, etc. So you have a third. But then after probation closes, you have the full wrath of God being experienced by the unrighteous. Right? So they're angry. I mean, you can imagine that there, there are some horrific things that take place prior to probation's close. God's trying to wake the world up to get their attention. Right? So mercy is still lingering, right? Mercy is still lingering here. Mercy is still in operation here, even though these things are happening. And, and the world's being decimated, in a sense. But once probation closes, the full wrath of God is now being poured out. And people are angry. And that's, that's a typical human reaction, you know. When things go bad, people get upset. Okay? Particularly if they don't understand what's, what's happening. They're angry. And it says, your wrath has come. So that means probation is closed. <clears throat> the 24 elders now go through a, a progression of other statements here that indicate um, the, the sequence of events that occur after that. The time of the dead, the time of the dead that they should be judged. Well, what happens once probation closes and the plagues are poured out and Christ comes, right? Christ comes. The saints go where? Heaven. They go to heaven to judge men and angels during the millennial period, right? The land is at rest. These are a thousand Shemitah years, so the land is at total rest. Okay, it's uninhabited, no activity. Because they're Shemitah years. I had to stop for a minute. We <clears> keep <throat> talking about the close probes, close probes. And we know that there are, we've got we've got the uh, trumpets before the close of probation. Will we the first four trumpets, we may not necessarily, because they are, they are, uh, uh, natural disaster. Natural disaster. But, <coughs> without a shadow of a doubt, we will know the fifth one, for sure. But there's no actual way that we can know when the first four, the first trumpets sounds. Yes, sir. Well, again, that would have to be... I guess up for a matter of interpretation. Uh, hail and fire followed mingled with blood. They were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green all the green grass was burned up. I think that'll be a pretty significant trumpet. Okay, yeah. but what I'm saying, how do we? Could, could it be that the Pope's address to the Senate and the Congress and stuff on the 24th of September could get started the 1260 days? Could that be the first trumpet? And, and the reason you're asking that question is because the Pope was staying where he shouldn't have been. He should not have been there. Okay, so, he's, he's, so just like, just like the Roman army back in in 66 A.D. with Cestius, they were they were surrounding Jerusalem. That's what you're referring to. Right. Right? They're surrounding Jerusalem. This is in the book of Luke, Luke 21, and so the army is standing where it, it should have been, be. right? And so it begins. It begins a time clock. Right. The the clock begins. What I'm saying. Okay. Clock has the clock so part. a time. A time begins. And what transpires back there in in uh, they Jerusalem? Lift and that was the signal for what? For the Christians to get. That out was the signal the for the Christians to leave. But it started a clock. And who showed up? And when did he show up? He right. showed up four years later in 70 A.D. to destroy Jerusalem. And actually, three and a half, three and a half years later. Uh, Titus shows up. Okay. So here's a perfect example of this three and a half year period uh, coming into play. So my question so is, has our clock started for the 1260 days? It could, yes, it could have. It could have. But will we, will, we, will we or do we know for a fact or will we know when that clock starts? I guess we'll have to just keep our eyes open, won't we? But we'll keep our eyes open, and uh, I mean, obviously, I don't think we. Have, I don't think we can see first three and a half because they're natural disasters. Now well, the fifth one, without a shadow of doubt, we'll know when that three and a half starts because that's when Satan appears, representing Christ, or 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 um, 
taking Christ's place. Personates them, yeah. Yeah, personates Christ. Yeah. So now, we don't know they are from, without well, a doubt. How many people here will be committed to let Larry know when we see the first trumpet call? <laughs> how many people? Know Larry. Well, we, we, we will let Larry know. As long as somebody lets me know, yeah, I have And you folks can write in too. When we see the first trumpet fall, I have a little right. trouble, you know, with this year. I mean, the hope being there in the to, uh, speaking Congress. The, the Vatican is a sovereign government. Sure. And uh, that, that gives him the right to spend there. Well, uh, he. It, it may give him a, a, a legal right to stand there because he is a sovereign government, and he, he's, but he's been invited by a Protestant nation. And a Protestant nation, the United States, in a, in a full session of Congress, that's where we speak as a nation. Okay? Yeah, when the Bible talks about nations speaking, that's where we speak. Our legislature is what, what uh, you know, that's, that, that government speaks for all of us, right? Yeah, well, I mean, that's okay. going to... Well, would you, would, you, would you have been okay? Were you okay with the Pope being there? I wasn't in the He could stay over there. I don't even want him over here at all. But no, there look, were... you've got Binger there. He is a, a, a Jesuit, a Catholic, and he is the one who spent 20 years to get him over here. Yeah, I think if you took a poll, if you, if you were able to, to actually ask every American, do you think it was okay that the Antichrist, the, the Pope that hit himself, see, I can call him Antichrist because he himself has, has uh, designated that that is his title because he claims to be infallible yeah, and he claims, he claims, to, be, the Holy he claims Father, to be God on earth, Christ God. on earth. Okay? Mm. So he set himself up just from the, what he has said, and what the papacy has said. They've, they have, the popes have set themselves up to be Antichrist, okay? which means in place of. They set themselves up in place of Christ. Okay? <laughs> now, if you were to take that poll, I would wager to say that probably you would have maybe 70 30. 70% 70 of the people in the country would say, no, he shouldn't have been there. Maybe 30, 35%, because there are a lot of Catholics uh, in the country, uh, legally and illegally. But uh, you have a lot of them saying, oh, yeah, no problem. Okay? But I think the majority of people in the country would have said, he shouldn't have been there. Because I wouldn't want him there. I mean, we're a Protestant nation. We're protesting against... Who are we protesting against? Against the... We're protesting yeah. against Rome. Okay? Yes, and, Rome. The, yes, the... and the fable that they hold up as Christianity. We're protesting against that. So why would, would I want to invite the pretty individual to try to kill me? Why would I want to invite him here to... Yeah, I was telling somebody, I was no. talking to somebody just yesterday, and I was telling them, you know, we, we, uh, we got on a particular subject, and I said, people don't realize that, and, and we're not, we're not uh, speaking, we're not speaking uh, inappropriately uh, about the members, about people right. of the, of the yes, Catholic Church. It's a right. system okay. we're talking about. It's a corrupt right. system. The, the leadership is a corrupt system. Okay? Just like the Sanhedrin in the first century became a corrupt system. I mean, here Jesus shows up, and they don't want any parts of it. Okay? They had become corrupt, all right. So in thinking, so it's it's the system. But uh, you know, uh, the the papacy. If you look back in history, the papacy is the greatest terrorist organization. You know, we're all concerned about terrorism these days. Well, their history uh, shows very clearly in two distinct ways. No, in other words, they, they had crusades during the 1260 year period. Anybody who didn't agree with them, they went over and just annihilated them. Okay? So they were f trying to force people to believe what... In other words, if you had a different opinion about something, you were at risk of being, being killed. Well, they also, the Catholic, the Catholic Church, the Jesuits, they also started the Muslim faith or religion. And so... Is it any surprise that they would have the same thinking? Same hey, if you, don't, if you don't believe what we say, off with your head, right? I mean, that's the same concept. Well, that's it comes, it comes, what his other part of doing that. Right, right, it comes from Catholicism. So when we look at ISIS or supposed terrorists today, that's still part of the papal and Jesuit ideology. Well, you see, it works so well in the past. We'll still work today. Just cut your heads off. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a way of intimidating and forcing people well, to do what they want to do. Uh, walk down the aisles of Hitler with Hitler through his uh, army and inspected them just like uh, uh, generals. 
Yeah, they were first hoping that Hitler would win. They sided with him, and then they later changed. Yeah, they thought, yeah, we'll win. We okay. We were doing that. All right, well, again, we're not, uh, we want to be clear that, you know, Catholic people, we love Catholic people. It's uh, the, we love the people. It's the system. It's the system. It's a system that they're supporting, caught up in, that uh, is inappropriate, just like anything else. Um, okay, so the, the uh, time of the dead that they should be judged... That's during the time of the millennium, and the tw 24 hours go on to say, and thou shalt uh, shall reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, etc., uh, and those who, who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. When, when is the wicked going to be destroyed? It was destroyed after, at the, after, after the, the millennial period. Years. After the millennial period. After they're going to be destroyed at the third coming. God makes the. You well, they'll be destroyed when Jesus comes, but they'll lay uh, dead and desolate for a thousand years when right. he comes back again and raises the dead. And then when this earth is made over, that's when they're destroyed too. Yeah. You know, this is a great thing for those of you that are watching. This is You, you know what's going to happen whenever they're raised up, but Satan's going to tell them, uh -huh. hey, inside that city there yeah, is that's a my tree. City. That's my city. And if we can right. get in there and get to that tree, we'll, we'll live, live forever. forever. Yeah. And, and they come up off the breath of the earth and they charge the city. That's whenever the earth is made over. Yeah, fire comes down. This very same stuff we have in the case here, Brimstone. You know, that's what's neat. I want to tell you folks, that's what's neat about having a home church. You have this interaction. You know, this isn't a preaching service. This is questions and responses and people adding comments in. That's what's great about a home church. And all, you, and all you need to do is get a couple people together, and uh, you can have a great time in the Lord. And, <clears throat> and that's and really what it's about. Right uh, yeah, it's not what it's about. It's about exhausting what's in the Word. you remember, too. Okay, so now, now look at verse 19. Here you have the 24, 24 elders stepping in and, and doing their thing, making their declaration. All heaven is excited about what's happened. And, and then it says, then... That word, then, the temple of God was opened in heaven. Now, does this mean then after the millennial period? Right? Well, because, you know, we, we just, the, the 24 elders just took us through past the millennium. Is John saying then after the millennium the temple was open? Or when does that happen, do you think? See? I think the then, the temple was opened in heaven, actually comes in after verse 15. Uh, before you have the 24 hours commentary, so to speak. In other words, once, once probationary time closes, is there any, any further need of intercess intercession? There will be none. Okay, there, there's no longer any need, right? This is uh, the chapter 12 of Daniel, chapter 1, or verse 1, where Michael stands up, right? Michael, one who is like God, stands up, right? And probation, there's a time of trouble such as never was. That's the place. Right, that's when the full wrath of God is being poured out, and you have full light meeting full darkness. Right? And so, the then, the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Okay? Now, and then it says, and there were lightnings. So what, what happens when that, when that temple is open? What happens when that whole, most holy place is open? And the, the ark is, is open for, for, for view? What takes place? Voices, lightnings, noises, and... thundering, earthquake, great hell. Okay, so that's taking place. So how do we know this is the close of probationary time? Well, it sounds like it to me anyway. Okay, uh, two, one, two things we want to bring out here. One is that, you know, a lot of people um, uh, in our archaeology research, as most of you probably know, we, we uh, deal with the find of the earthly ark below Golgotha, below the crucifixion site. Okay? And it had to be there for a specific reason. Because the uh, it, was, it was God was calling it back into service to <clears throat> to receive the blood of Christ, which was an illustration uh, of the law the law of blood coming together, illustrating his his both of his sacrifices, both human and divine. Alright? So we've talked about that extensively. But, but at any rate, not not only was there an ark on the earth, but there's also an ark in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, a most holy place in heaven, just like there was a most holy place down here 
in the wilderness tabernacle. That was so, built without hands. Built without hands, okay. And so this one was a pattern, he says in Hebrews, right? Right. Says, the author says this was a pattern of things in the heavenly. And where you might have two gold angels standing on the side of the ark of the mercy seat down oh, here, God. in heaven what do you have? You don't have the real You have the real thing. You have real angels standing there, okay? So this one was a pattern. So you have an ark in heaven, an earthly throne, and you have, of course, the most holy place in heaven as well. We have to remember the ark itself is God's throne, period. God's throne, correct. So, yeah. If, and the foundation of his throne is the law. To work, to work. Right. Here we have the, the Ten Commandments in it. He is the Ten Commandments. Exactly, he, he is. I right. see, it's, He's the it's, way, it's, the truth. It's, yeah, and, and, he, and there in law is not up there but, or anything like that. Right. The, the ark there is nothing more than the throne of throne God. Throne of God. Exactly, I agree 100%. Okay, so the other thing, I want to just take you back to chapter 8 for a moment. And where all this got started, you know, here's John uh, seeing this vision where it all got started. And he gives a general summary, and then he goes into the detail of the first uh, trumpet sound, the second trumpet sound. Look at chapter 8, and look at verse 2. I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came, stood at the altar, and he was given much incense, much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which before the throne. The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then what did the angel do? The angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and what did he do? Cast he threw it. He cast it. He threw it to the earth, and there were noises and thunderings and lightnings. And earth. See, you get the same thing going on when that happens. Okay, and so John is giving us the beginning and the ending of the whole process, and then he goes steps back and says, "Okay, now let me give you the detail of the seven angels that are sounding." Well, he told you what was going to happen. Then he told you how, how it was going to happen. The detail of it. We're in detail. So. When, when that sensor is thrown down, you know, Mike K.L., right, who's, who's inter interceding in behalf, he stands up. And why does he stand up? Because he's preparing to do what? To come back. Okay, because probationary time has closed. All right. And so that's what's being presented here when the temple is open. And it's open in heaven. So who's seeing that the temple is open? All the angels. All the angels. So I, all everybody in heaven now knows that probation has closed, and what are, what are they going to get ready to do then? Get ready. Yeah, they're going to be boat. get ready to come. Now, okay. oh, I have a question. Okay. Okay. If all the angels see this and, and see Michael seen that, and know that the close, close of probation is taking place, are our guardian angels there? Waiting to come and get us. And remember, Michael, Christ, is in the most holy place. Right? right. Mm -hmm. okay. So nobody is seeing him, per se, until this event. Right. Okay? So when they see him, when the temple's open, the opening of the temple there is the sign in heaven that this is getting ready to happen. The second coming is getting ready to happen. You see. Which is another indication that these plagues... Um, we believe will just be a period of 45 days. Okay, now where did that come from? From the 1260 to the 1300. Yeah, it's in the book of Daniel, the 12th chapter, I think the, near the very end of that chapter. Blessed and holy is he who goes to the 1335. So that's 45 days after the 1290. You got 1260, you got 1290. Four or five days after the 1290, you have, and we believe that that will be the time when it's Christ is coming, 45 days later. So these plagues are happening where? All around, All around the earth, right? And when you, we haven't gotten to chapter 16 of uh, Revelation yet, but when you look at chapter 16, the first verse, it talks about, the first and second verse talks about the angels being given these bowls, these plagues to be poured out. And it says... The command is, go your ways. Now. Plural. Now. Plural. Go your ways. Okay. They're given these plagues to be, who are they poured out? Oh. 
Yeah, who are they pouring out on? The earth. The uh, earth, but, 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 but who, who yeah. are they, who uh, are being affected uh, by the plagues? The wicked. Okay, the wicked. The righteous. So when once probation closes, now, during the time of the trumpets, will, will there be martyrs? Will there be righteous people that are martyred and killed and whatnot? Yeah. See, the, during Absolutely. the trumpets, it's the Christians who are persecuted. During the plagues, it's the sinners, the sinners. wicked, who are persecuted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's that's a good summary as well. Okay, so now we're in the seventh trumpet there, and we know that the seventh trumpet has brought us to close of probationary time. Okay, and uh, we know that after that period, the full wrath of God is going to be poured out, affecting the wicked. There won't be any righteous people that are killed at that at that point. But the group comes into focus particular focus uh, at the end of time, and particularly uh, just before and after the close of probationary time, there's a particular group that the book of Revelation highlights that brings in focus. Okay? Now, typically, when you look at chapter 12 in the book of Revelation, uh, we see uh, different events like, uh, you know, God taking his church and hiding them in the wilderness. Okay? And we throw that back where? We throw that back in history. And we say, oh, that was during 1260 years. Right? Church was being persecuted through the Dark Ages by the papacy. And eventually God, you know, found them a refuge, etc. So we make those kind of applications. But what if, you know, what if we kept the context here in, in line with the very end of time? That would make then chapter 12, that would make it an ultimate fulfillment. How, how, how about if we looked at chapter 12 from the standpoint of the ultimate fulfillment instead of back yes. thousands of years ago in, in history? Okay? Now those applications, again, are valid. And, uh, and I, I know we can make many applications, and I see those as valid. But what if we took chapter 12 and kept it into the context of, the, of and, and continued from chapter 11? <clears throat> and kept it in the context of an ultimate fulfillment, what kind of things would, would we be looking at then? So can we do that this morning? Can we go ahead and try to do that and see where we go? Okay. So let's do that. <clears throat> Look at chapter 12 here. It says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven. And again, this, uh, this word great is this word right here. Megas. Okay. Great sign in heaven. A monumental, a stupendous, a magnificent sign appeared in heaven, right? What was the sign? It's a woman. A woman, a woman clove with the sun. Now, who's a woman in, pro in Bible prophecy? Who's a woman? The church. The church. Woman is the church, right? So here's, so, so John is seeing now, he's seeing the focus shift from probation time, pr probation closing now. You see, that he's, he's seen the, the, the shift from that event, um, and, and and how heaven is rejoicing, heaven is excited, and, and what's taking place in heaven. Now he's he's going to bring it down here, and look at what's going on on the earth. Is it the okay. church or the? Okay, it's a woman clothed the with the sun. Me. What does that mean? A woman clothed with the sun. Uh, if we went outside this morning, it's it's a very sunny day out there. Could we just? Look at the sun directly. No. It would be difficult. Uh, of course, it's somewhat dangerous. To well, do they that. were sun worship way, way, way back there. Okay. Has that got anything to do with it? Well, let's look and see. Okay, let's look and see. Let me let me take you to Revelation 19 for a second. In Revelation 19. Called <coughs> push, you know. Was That's true. They're 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 Babylon, Babylon and and whatnot. They, they were sun worshippers. They worship the sun. Okay. But here's a woman, not not worshipped, but here's a woman that is clothed, wrapped with the sun. She's clothed with the sun. Okay. Could that be uh, wrapped or her garments? Or? Well, no. Let's 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 take a look in chapter 19. Chapter 19 of Revelation. Uh, if you start at verse 7, it says, "Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come." Now, when Christ comes, right, uh, he's also referred to as what? 
The bride. The bride I mean, groom. The bride groom, okay. And who's the bride groom coming to get? The bride. The bride, the right? Bride. The, the church. The church, okay. So, so we're going to be glad and rejoice about that, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife, who's his wife? The, the church, church, right? The church has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed. Now what does it mean to be arrayed? I don't like that. Clothed. Yeah, it means to be clothed, <clears throat> dressed, okay? Be clothed in fine linen, clean and bright. That you can't get much brighter than the sun. Okay, clean and bright. So we're talking about, we're talking here about the pure church, the clean church, right? In fact, let me show you how Paul emphasizes it in Ephesians chapter 5. I'll just read this. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he must sanctify. What does sanctify mean? To make holy. It means to make holy, set apart for holy use, and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Okay? So the Bible tells us in John 17 that it's the Word that sanctifies us. It's the Word that uh, has the power to make us holy. It says that He might present to to her, or He might present her to Himself, a glorious church. That's uh, again a very brightly shining church, a glorious church, a brightly shining church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. But she should be holy and without blemish. So, when Christ comes for His church, what's His church going to look like? Holy, without blemish, spotless, shining brightly, glorious, okay? Like the sun, okay? So we're talking about the true church here. We're not talking about the corporation. The people they claim to believe. You're talking about you know, the probation too, because of for us to be that way, he's going to keep us that way. He's going to close probation before that happens. Right. Now, I think this is referring to a specific group of people. A specific group of people that will be alive and will be kept alive and preserved, not only to this place, but through the plagues. And they will, they will live through never, ever tasting death. And they will see Jesus come and will be caught up after the righteous dead have been resurrected and caught up. They'll be caught up in, uh, and live with him. And that's the 144,000. Okay, that's the 100. So chapter 7. And, chapter, and the only reason is... is because the, they will be the ones to live to the end, is because they're the only one left alive. They're the only righteous. That's left alive. That's left alive. So the the righteous number, the group of the righteous people that are left alive, is 144,000. There are whole lots of reasons for that. In fact, uh, if you're interested, I've written a manuscript on that on the 144,000, and I'd be happy to share it with anybody. If you want to write in, I'd be happy to email that to you, send that to you. Uh, it's going to be one of our one of our ebooks on 144,000. But it says here in chapter seven <clears throat> that God is about to close probation, right? He's, the angels of the four corners of the earth are holding the four winds. Well, let, let me stop right there. Up to this point here, up to the point of close of probation, during this during this time for the first trump or these trumpets, all the righteous will die except for the 144,000. They will go by the way of the grave except the 144,000. Once the plague starts, the only ones left after close of probation is the 144,000. Because nobody else calls. Everybody else done gone by the way of the grave. Correct, right? And actually, God in mercy has done that. Right. Okay, it says here in Revelation 14. 57, well, Isaiah 57, 1 and 2. Is it saying? Yeah, Isaiah 57, 1 and 2. And John is, understands exactly. that verse. And John includes that here in Revelation 14. Here is the patience of the saints, and here they have to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Right. Uh, <clears throat> 
it says, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So, now, from now on means from the first trumpet. I think so. Until the seventh trumpet. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Or to the close of probation. Because this is going to be a very devastating time. If it <coughs> would have been, would, when Satan steps in himself under the fifth trumpet, when he's pictured there stepping in because he knows he has a short time, uh, literally all hell breaks loose on this right. planet. Okay? And so under the, under the, he, he gets his army together and he takes the world. And he, he, as we talked about the last couple of weeks, he, he initiates a global warfare. And what happens in this global warfare? Uh, a third, right. yeah. a third of humanity is killed off. Okay, cool. and obviously there'll be righteous people that are, are, are end up uh, being caught up in that as well. So, <clears throat> let's go back. I want to. What, what we're doing is we're looking at chapter twelve from <clears throat> more of a uh, ultimate fulfillment at the very end, just a continuation uh, of the same thinking in terms of this. When does the seventh trumpet occur? Just before probation closes. Okay. And it includes the closing of human probation. So, chapter 12 is giving us, some, I think, some greater insight as to what occurs on earth with God's people at that time. All right? So, this, the church is clothed with the, and it's not the corporation, but it's the church, the true believers, clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. <clears throat> now, what do you think that means? Here's this pure woman. Standing on the moon. Okay. Well, she's the yeah. reflection of the sun, which the sun represents Christ. She is the reflection. She has no light of her own. Right. She is only <clears throat> reflecting Christ. Character. Right. The moon. Right. And it, it, full moon right, is only a reflection of the SUE. Right. Right. So yeah. So the the full moon principle is that the 144,000 are shining like full moons. That's one great application there. Another is the moon is the lesser light. He's the greater light. Right? Pointing to the greater light. Right? And what's the lesser light pointing to the greater light in terms of Bible prophecy? The spirit of prophecy is the lesser light pointing to the greater light of Christ himself. Okay? So she's standing on, she's reflecting the character of Christ. She's standing on the prophetic word. Okay? But also... The moon was instrumental in initiating what? The, time. the timing the of the spring and the fall feasts. Okay, so the moon was also the, the setting of the new moon was instrumental in <clears throat> establishing the beginning of each month. Okay, and was instrumental in the feastly cycle, the seven-month Jewish cycle for the feast. Okay, so here you have lots of things being in, uh, actually referenced here. Of this woman standing on the moon, okay, wrapped in the glory of the sun, and we could say that's the S O N. All right, and on her head, a garland of twelve stars. So you get the picture. <clears throat> this one standing there, she has this kind of like garland or head, head thing of twelve stars. What could the twelve stars mean? Tribes. Okay, you got twelve tribes of Israel. Twelve months of the year. Twelve months of the year. Well, sometimes thirteen in the disciples, Jewish. Twelve disciples. Twelve disciples. Twelve apostles. Okay. Twelve foundations. You got the twelve the foundations of the city. You've got twelve gates of the city, etc., etc. So twelve is is a very instrumental number in God's in God's perspective. It's a it's a multiple of the Godhead times four, right? Four being a number of Total, totality, etc. So the Godhead, you know, the earth is always, sometimes the whole complete earth is referenced as, you know, north, south, east, west, or the four corners of the earth, that kind of thing, which is language that you find here in the book of Revelation. So 12 is the number of complete maturity. Complete maturity. You know, the whole city is built on 12s, uh, a factor of 12s, you know, that's, that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate. Uh, uh, I guess prize is not the best word. That's the ultimate reward that God <clears throat> did. You know, I guess the ultimate reward would not be the city, but it would be eternity, eternal life. But 12 is where you have um, you know, the complete city being 
being put together, and so it's a, it's a number that's significant to complete or full maturity. And so, and to multiply and so, itself, and so the would church, the in other words, the church has had lots of ups and downs, right? When you go through and look at the history of God's church, and when did that start? Who's the church? It's not the building. It's people. not the building, right? Real. Who's the church? The people are the, the people. church. And so when did God's church start? Not only that, the people. Creation. What is the temple of God? The creation. Made? God's oh. church started at creation, okay? Adam and Eve, the first church. For their family, the first church, okay? And so a lot of the last 6,000 years have been lots of ups and downs and, and skewing off the straight and narrow path and etc., etc., okay? But uh, there's always been a thread of truth that but, certain you know, individuals... One church. One true church, right? One true church. Yeah. So it says, Paul but, says in Ephesians 4. But, because it's supposed to be the temple of God, you know. The Spirit of God is directing the, the, the believers. There's no question. So, you know, you got uh, you got one true church that, that, that goes through, not, not corporations, not people that proclaim to, to do and be, but the truth that goes through. Okay. So, uh, then he says, uh, and, and of course, you know, even though the church has had its ups and downs, at the end, as we get close to this place, a group of people, the remnant, the 144,000, whatever you want to call them, they take seriously the power of the gospel, and they begin to reflect the character of Christ, just like Uncle Enoch, way back when, walked with God 300 years, and God came and took him. Okay, it's the same reason. All right, so the church rose to this place of full maturity, and that's represented here by the woman standing on the moon. Okay, the church rose to full maturity. And, and then John goes through some of the detail of how that happens. Then being with child, or, or actually the, the warfare that's going to, to uh, be involved here. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So here's the, the woman now is pregnant. Okay? And the woman is going to bring forth the birth of, of who? Of what? Christ. Okay? Or the true church. The true church. Okay? True church. Another sign appeared in heaven. Now look, here's the adversary. Another church, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon had seven heads and ten horns. Now, it's interesting, the seven heads and ten horns, where do you find the detail of that? Daniel. Next chapter. Okay. Next chapter, well, also in Daniel, but also in the next chapter, chapter 13, is the beast that comes up, you know, out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, etc. That's the composite one world system. Right? That's the one world system. That, and when does that develop? Down here at the end. Not way back in history, but down at the end. Okay? So, so here you have um, John seeing the nemesis or the, the adversary uh, coming into picture here against the, 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 the faithful at the end. They come to full maturity. Seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems on his, on his heads. His tail drew a a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now why, why is John emphasizing this? Threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up in, to God and his throne. And then the woman fell into the water. So why is John bringing out all this, this what the work of the adversary here? What happens down here at the end? He explained how it's going okay. to happen. It's just not. It's just not. It's just not uh, uh, Satan that that steps into the picture and and wants to eliminate. And see, you got to remember, the the goal here for Satan is to eliminate God's people, eliminate any semblance of the truth. And so, uh, in order to do that, he he calls everybody. Everybody that it was on his side. Everybody that fell. That, that fell from heaven with him. Everybody gets involved in this picture at the end. Okay, it's not just Satan himself, but, but all of his host of evil angels uh, get involved because wh what are they coming up against? They're coming up against people that have grown to full light. So it's, it's explaining this picture of full light 
really conflicting with full darkness. And when we look at this a male child that's being born is to rule the nations when iron is caught up to God in his throne, um, certainly one application 2,000 years, 2000 years ago was who? It was Christ himself, right? It was Christ himself. When he was born, the dragon was there, ready to devour him, the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so we could see an application uh, of that. But at the end, you have the 144,000 who have come to full maturity, Satan comes against them with everything that he has. I've, I've got to ask Everything that he has. Herod had an army to go get him. Had to ask this. And now it's a world army. You had Christ, then when God's throne there, you had the four beasts. I have no idea what the four beasts are. Then you have the 24 elders. Then you have the 144,000. Okay. The 144,000 standing around the throne with the 24 elders, does that make them special in some way? I think yes. How? I mean, if I'm going to be one of them, I don't know. I don't know how. Yeah, well, number one, there's some unique things about 144,000 apart from the rest of the redeemed. And, and please understand, make sure we, we, get, we get this uh, stated. It's not just the 144,000 that are redeemed. It's millions of people that are redeemed. That we just mean the 144,000 that are living. All that is left, living at of, the end of the righteous. Right. Correct. I believe that that's true. And there, and, and you get that publication I mentioned. There are reasons for that. Okay. But uh, yeah, just to what s makes them special? Um, I know that people sing the song of Moses. But other than that, I don't know what it is. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Right. Okay. But and that's important. But they live through a time such as never was. Right. Okay. So that that in, a, in itself, um, and time that we can't even imagine how bad that will be. You, you follow me? And a time where there's no there's no legitimate reason for anybody to survive. Things are going to be so horrific. There's no legitimate reason for any of us to survive. We're only kept. We really should survive. We should. We're only kept by the power of heaven, by by grace and power of heaven. So there's no real legitimate reason why we survive that time, uh, except God is like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We're 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 in the fiery furnace, and it's been heated seven times hotter. So there's no legitimate reason. It's a miracle. See, being military, I look at things. Okay. You've got God's throne. <clears throat> then you've got the four beasts. Then you got the twenty-four. I look at rank. Okay, right. you got the twenty-four hours. Then you got the hundred forty-four thousand. Yeah. Okay, then you got the great multitude. But there was something special about this hundred forty-four thousand that they are given the privilege and the honor of standing with the 24 elders around the throne of God. And some commentators also... Alone see a well, it's because of what they've gone through for sure and what they've suffered for the cause of truth in Christ and, and, and the greater understanding that they have of the atonement. Um, they also are, have privileges in heaven. They're, they are, from what some commentators have, have recorded, they uh, are ones that worship or serve God in His temple in heaven, okay, which would be the capstone of the holy city. When it comes down. So yeah, they have special privileges because of what they've gone through. And there's another fact, there are other reasons, and I want to go into all the other reasons, but you, you probably have, you have publication. If you reread that, it'll give you some insight there. Uh, question. Yes. When Jesus was resurrected, it said uh, that uh, many of the saints who slept arose and went into the city. Correct. How, it just says many. Is that the 24 elders? Or? It could be anybody. Yeah, I think that um, later on, when they, when, at the ascension of Christ, I think that it mentions um, over, over 100 people went, with went, went up with him. I have to go back and look, but I think it's over 100, maybe 120 or so that were mentioned as, as being caught up. But there was a, a multitude of what I would call first fruits that went back ascended with Christ. What was that? Is that in here? Yeah, it's in one of the. I think it's in the book of Acts, actually. Okay, so. I, I've always wondered how, how many Acts 10. that that was uh, resurrected. 
urban went into the city, you know, when Jesus was resurrected. Right. Now, I know in our archaeology research, one of the places that was uh, discovered was the cave of Machpelah, the, the, the real cave of Machpelah. And in that cave, there were six crypts in that cave, six ledges, excuse me, in that, in that cave. And, of course, you know that in the cave of Machpelah, you had Abraham and Sarah, right? Yeah. And you had Isaac and what, Rebecca? Rebecca or Rachel? I think Isaac and Rebecca. Then you had, uh, pardon me? Jacob and Leah, right. So when, when uh, that cave was explored, when the cave was uncovered, uh, there were no remains. Even though those people were buried there, there were no remains in that, in that cave. So what did that mean? That, they've already got that means that they, they could have been part of that group Good. that was resurrected and went into the city in, when Christ was resurrected. So they, they could be, who knows, they could be a part of that. There's 24 elders that are up there. Okay. More so, than likely, Abraham, well, Isaac, and Jacob probably were. Yeah, I would, I, that would make perfect sense to me. You know, for sure. For sure. Along with Adam and yeah. Enoch and... Elijah and Elisha. Yeah, so many things we'll learn once Christ comes back and we'll sit down with them and talk to them. You know, that, that'll be exciting. Okay. And maybe they do. Yeah, of course. Okay, so I want to just get back to chapter 12 here and finish up. Uh, what I think is being pictured here, now notice what it says is that the woman, or the, the church, the true church, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there. How long? For 1260 days. So uh, we know that as this. 1,203 four days. Yeah, as this time uh, quickly, as we move quickly to this event, these events here, we know eventually that God's people will end up where? In hell. In the wilderness. They'll end up in the mountains. They'll end up in the forests. They'll end up in secluded places. Well, they'll end up in. <laughs> By way of okay, yeah. So, so again, the church is going to be severely persecuted at the end, <coughs> particularly after probation closes. Okay, uh, hunted down. Um, um, in fact, there'll be a death decree. That's what the next chapter really gets into, right? The next chapter goes into the detail of of uh, some of that persecution. And what will occur, and eventually it will ultimately end in a death decree. And so the wicked will be out there hunting down the righteous. But who why have, bother to do that when they ain't nothing to do about it? They don't know. They don't know that, that God is protecting them, you see. In fact, one commentator <clears throat> says, you know, when they raise their guns, uh, yeah, you know, they, they just they fall limp, you know, kind of thing. Well, yeah. and the, the, and they, the angels. The... Yeah, if you read the book, if you read the book, Triumph of God's Love, or... Well, the great controversy. In fact, uh, we're, we're getting ready to order a couple of cases of uh, great controversy books. So anybody out there that would like a copy that doesn't have one, we'd be happy to send you a copy. If uh, it says you want the to just, book gone. If you want to just write to us, we'll be happy to do that. Pardon me? It says the rainbow of God all shadows them. Rainbow of God. So what <clears> I'm <throat> saying is when you read chapter 12, in from an ultimate fulfillment standpoint, which brings you down to the very end of time, okay, uh, you, you, you begin to understand that it, it, it's about the people that live through to the end. And it's about the warfare that's, that Satan marshals to come against them. It's, it's the full light, full dark concept coming into play here. <clears throat> and uh, it, it eventually culminates, uh, as you read further down chapter 12, um, there's a bit of history, starting in verse 7. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought. Well, who won the battle? We know that Michael won the battle. The dragon was cast out. And, and no place was found in heaven. So the great dragon was cast out. The serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth. The angels were cast out with him. All of that. You see, I think what John is saying is that all of that is coming against God's people at the end of time. Right? Then I heard a loud voice saying, and has now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ have come. Okay? In other words, God's people at the end of time, they grow to this place of, as Paul says, uh, the full measure 
uh, the stature of Jesus Christ. Uh, remember when Satan came to Christ and was tempting him? You know, what did Jesus say? He wasn't afraid. He just said, it is written. You know, it is written. We have to live by every word uh, out of this book. He wasn't afraid. But Satan will bring uh, his hellish persecution because, because of what? Because he knows that he has a short time. That's exactly what it says here. It says, power and strength come. And for the accuser of the brethren, who accused them before God, day and has been cast down. And they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. So that's, where, that's the attitude that the 144,000 have. They are prepared to be martyrs if necessary. But God preserves them. God chooses a select few, just like he did with Gideon and his army. He did the same thing. In fact, that story of Gideon and his 300 is an illustration of, of what happens with 144,000. Instead of being on the plain of Jezreel, around in Israel, now it's worldwide. They're scattered around the world. Okay, But a select few that live through to the end. It says, uh, Therefore rejoice, O heaven, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. And here's a, it says, When the dragon saw... And, of course, dragon being a persecuting power, saw that he had been cast to the earth. He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male. To, to the male. Child is a, a wide word there. <clears throat> but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to a place where she is nourished for a time, time. So here again, we see this three and a half year period. It seems very clear to me. That God's people will be, once they flee, once they leave their homes and flee into the wilderness, it's going to be a, a 1260-day period of time. Okay? And I think it's important to understand that because it's not going to be this, you know, once you're out there living in the mountains or living in caves or living in, in, you know, in the forests and so forth, you're going to know that there is an expiration to this. This is not going to go on, you know, forever and ever or until you die. There's going to be an expiration. Right? And so the serpent, says the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman. People. And people. Okay, so people are going to come out and eventually be chase. trying to chase you and hunt you down, right? That's exactly what it's talking about here. It says that they might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood. You see, so... The, the places of refuge, the forest, the, the, the caves and the rocks, you know, they become a place of refuge and they help the redeemed survive until the Lord comes. But the dragon is enraged with the woman and is making war with her offspring to keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. This, this is more of a, again, I think the book of Revelation is dealing with the ultimate fulfillments of what takes place here. And... Certainly, we can look back and see applications in history, but the ultimate fulfillment, I think, is, is right before us. And the more we know, the more we know that this is what it's talking about, the better prepared we can be to, to actually survive and go through it. So, uh, and uh, the next chapter, the next chapter takes us into, of course, now probation is closed, and now the plagues are falling, and, pe and people are enraged at that. But the next chapter goes into more detail about the death decree and the, and, and the, the people involved in implementing that power. The ones that Satan is using, you see, this one world system that Satan is using to, to come against God's people. It's all about that. If you read the last ten, ten chapters of the book Great Controversy, you get a more vivid picture of, of this conflict that takes place at the end. But it's always been there. It's always been in Scripture. You see, we've just always made, we focused on the applications through history and not realized that these are the very things that are playing out at the very end. Okay, so, any thoughts, any comments? It's already started the fight. Oh, yeah, yeah no, no question. No, north of uh, Detroit, or New York, this church, I think it's the living word, it's a huge church. They just beat... A 17, 19-year-old boy to death, death, trying to make him confess his sins, and his brother, they beat him, and he's in the hospital up there right now, wow. that this is all in the news yesterday. Uh -huh. I saw that. And, uh, 
They were brothers. Even their mother and their father was part of it. Part of it. You know, when you try to force... Everybody in the church yeah. took a, a, a beat of my thing. Yeah. And you see, there's no way that... I mean, that's not that's not truth. The truth is, doesn't have to force people to, against their will. That's 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 the enemy. Well, they, may, they may have confessed, but yeah. that wouldn't didn't satisfy them. I think yeah. it said everyone you know, beat them with their fist. Yeah. Well, that's just totally that's the total antithesis of what the, what the truth of the gospel really advocates. You cannot force people to do what they don't want to do. If you eat, you don't have a free choice. Yeah, I mean, come on. I mean, it's just that's that's sad. It's very sad. And, and to see what that does is that paints that paints Christianity. You know, if that church claims to be a Christian church, it paints Christianity as as being nothing better than the papal power. Everybody, I, everybody around that lived around it said that there's weird things that goes on over there. In fact, they keep the doors locked over there. Yeah. Uh, the way uh, I understood it. Yeah. And it, it showed their mother and their father on yeah. TV, but it didn't show the boys that day. Well, the other thing, too, is that we had to be careful of. Um, there are a lot of things that have been presented in the news that are just made up. They're not actual events. They're things that have been made up. Uh, even killings and shootings and different things that, that have been staged and filmed and presented as something real to try to to uh, come against you know uh, gun ownership and to come against uh, you know the conservative movement or whatever. But here, in this situation, what if, what if that really didn't happen actually, but it was a story that was concocted and made up to try to paint a picture of Christians? In other words, to try to paint what kind of a negative picture of Christianity. And uh, well, the police department that did. Oh, yeah, well, I'm sure. Well, there are many police departments, unfortunately, that are involved in a lot of yeah, these, these schemes because they're fundraisers. <laughs> When you have a shooting or something that happens, like a um, you know, like school shooting or something, uh, it always becomes a big fundraiser, okay? And people gen and millions and millions of dollars are generated uh, and, and provided to emergency services and individuals, etc. And the event never really happened. It was it was something Hollywood production, if you will. You and I know that me and you will never agree on this. We will never completely and totally agree, and that's okay. Sure. But there are a lot of conspiracies, but I don't see conspiracies in everything. Some things are actually true. I'm, well, sure. I'm sure that there is a percentage. Obviously, they're legitimate. Um, for example, the, there's smoke. There's got to be fire. There, there was a shooting out in Oregon, right, recently, a couple weeks back. And we talked to a pastor friend of ours out there, and he said one of the victims was one of his church members. Okay, so that seems to add a little more legitimacy, to, you know, to that particular circumstance. However, there are other things that are too blatant to ignore. For example, this this recent one in Roanoke, where uh, the guy, the, the shooter, is videotaping as he's supposedly shooting this news reporter. Okay, well. There's a camera man there. He ain't going to agree on There's a camera there. Now listen, there's a cameraman there also shooting a live feed. Okay? Well, when you look at both of those films, the woman is doing something different in one film that she's not doing in the other. Now, so, so, so you know, you know, that supposed to, so you know that there's something wrong with this picture. The woman I will is, love you anyway, even if you yeah. are wrong. And, <laughs> and, and that woman, if she had gotten shot with hollow point rounds, from two feet away, there's no way that that guy could have missed you. You can see from his camp, he's pointing right at her chest. And she just goes, and run away? I don't think so. No, she would have been bunged back against the railing. and It, 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 it was a setup. I've seen several the reason she was things setup, there right? that they uh, have tragedy, and then they turn around and say, now if you want to help the family, this is where you it's send a fundraiser. Money. It's a fundraiser. And, and listen, millions of dollars are generated. I'm just saying, we got to be careful. I, I think we've come to a place that we really don't know, unless we're there, personally, if something has occurred or not. Because remember, society, the media is trying to, who do you think controls the media? 
Is the media controlled by Christian conservative people that, that no. promoted the gospel? No. Of course not. So, so the media and, and people behind the media, they're, they're trying to move society in a certain direction. What did we just read about in chapter 12 here? What, what, what direction is the enemy trying to move society in? A one-world control setting. Yeah. A one-world control system. Yeah, get verified. A one-world control system that will eventually be used to do what? Eliminate control. those who follow the truth. Okay? See, the, the world is being brought together in a coalition to do one thing. And that is to eliminate, to get rid of those who stand on truth. Make no, no, make no mistake about that, you see. That's why all this is happening. So, these things that we see happening, you know, we got to look at them with, I think, more of a, a uh, critiquing eye, you know, a little more scrutiny, because they're designed to accomplish something, okay? And I still love you, Larry, no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> he knows that. He knows that. That's what I like about our group here. We don't have to agree, but we love one another That's no matter what. That's right. And uh, we learn, no? We learn. That's right. And the different perspectives, even those... You folks that are watching, if you have a little different view perspective, that's fine. It's great. That's wonderful. In fact, we've had people write in and share different things with us, and we always want to consider sure. those things. Sure. We always want to consider yeah. those things. I'll say it plainly: nobody has, nobody has all, nobody has the total picture here. That's right. Okay. I think God is he gives various people parts of the picture, but nobody has the full picture. Nobody's ever going to exhaust everything that's in here. In fact, I think we'll have all eternity we'll be studying through some and of the concepts. And we'll never exhaust. We'll never exhaust everything that's in this book. So all we can do is keep studying, keep looking, keep digging, and God will bless us as a result of that. Amen. And the Spirit of God will bring us together. There will be, there will be a remnant that will live through to the end, praise God. That remnant people are a vindication of the character of Christ and the character of God, which is what has been on trial for these last 6,000 years. So uh, it's an important role that God is asking us to play, and hopefully, um, hopefully, all of my friends will take it to heart. Okay. All right. So let me uh, let's let's go ahead and ask you to pause for a minute, and bow your heads, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Okay. Father, once again, we want to thank you for the time that we've had to open your Word. Uh, it is inexhaustible. It is incredible insight that you. Uh, have not only displayed, but bring forth through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray and ask, Lord, that you will continue to guide and direct us, continue to help us understand more fully the events as they unfold uh, that are taking place in these last days. We ask and pray, pray Lord, that you would uh, bless each family here, that you would bless those who are watching online or who will eventually watch at some point. Uh, help us all to realize that we need to get ready for what's ahead. We need to prepare. And we do pray and ask, Lord, that uh, if you can use us in the finishing of your great work, we consent, we are willing uh, to be used. And so prepare us for that time, for those months. And most of all, save us all in your kingdom when you come, is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. And for those that are here in, uh, at our place, we're asking a blessing upon the food, the physical food, that it might nourish us strengthen us to follow your will. And we ask also a blessing on all those uh, in the world that are, that are seeking truth and understand. Draw near to them, Father. We ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next week. One other thing. Right after the move, there is a sign that says, Vote for Jimmy Howie for sure. Uh -huh.